Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Central Europe. I hope everybody has had a wonderful week and is staying positive in light of all the challenges in the world today. Staying productive because that is the way to succeed and to triumph. Hi Maxlissa. Hi Deepa. Nadia, good to see many students joining this class. Our focus is on the listening section of the IELTS exam. Listening is the same in the general and in the academic uh, version of the test. And uh, we're looking specifically at part three and part four. I'm going to give you some ideas on how to get that uh, band nine score. Welcome Alpha Forest, welcome members as well. Um, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS success, visit us there. For the general IELTS, check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generaliltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have lots and lots of information for you to help you improve your English and your communication. Welcome, Nico, me here, Prashita, Rashika. Good to see four members in a row in the chat. And welcome, everyone. Our websites look like this. This is our general IELTS website here. It's the green background. You can click that big red button to join the premium package and get access to all of our HD videos, our interactive courses, and our practice exams. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access, so definitely well worth it. We are an IELTS registration center. We are IELTS uh, British Council agents. So. Uh, We've got lots and lots of valuable information for you. Uh, this is our academic web portal here at aehelp.com. You can click that big uh, red button to uh, join us there. Welcome our uh, moderator, Carolina. Hi. Okay, everyone. So if you have any questions about the IELTS exam, I'm happy to answer. Uh, my email is adrian at aehelp.com. Uh, you can send me an email there. If you would like to get uh, hard copy exam books for practice, you can search for our exams on Amazon, A Helps Academic IELTS and GE Helps uh, General IELTS. So right now we have listening part three, part four. These are the more challenging uh, parts of the listening section. And then tomorrow we have a Q&A session for members and we have speaking part three, uh, for everyone. So uh, make sure that you're here tomorrow as well. Learning regularly and consistently is the key to success. Uh, yesterday we did listening part one and two. If you missed that, that's okay. I shared a very important tip and definitely I think this is great to follow. Um, it's very easy to do uh, in the computer-based exam as well. So tip one, during the introduction and instruction time of the audio, um, take a look at the topics for part two, three, and four so that your brain is primed and ready for that information. Uh, and uh, we did that yesterday, and so we learned that uh, part three and four, what we're looking at today, part three will be something about trade, and part four will be something about the artist uh, Michelangelo. So that's what we can look forward to. And we're going to start... Uh, part three, uh, listening right away. So get ready with a pencil, piece of paper, or on your computer. Uh, please put the answers into a separate document or on a sheet of paper. Do not put them in the chat. That can become confusing for other uh, people watching. So save your answers until the end. And then we will go through them together. And I will give you tips, strategies as we do that on uh, the ways that you can um, get higher band scores, get more answers correct. So uh, just for this audio, I'm going to jump back to our website here and get into uh, my student account. That's where we find all of our goodies, um, including our computer-based practice tests and lots and lots of videos and audio CDs. And this is coming from our fifth exam so it is CD5 and track three because it's part three. So everybody get ready. Um, if it's a bit quiet for you, uh, please turn up the volume. If the screen is not clear, make sure your YouTube is set to 720p. 
okay? Because it's a live stream low latency, so set it to 720p. And um, again, if you have a headset, uh, it's good to use a headset. In the computer-based exam, that's what you use, and, and many IELTS test centers, you use a headset. So listening and answering with a headset is good practice. Okay, everyone, here we go. Listen, answer in a sh separate sheet, and we'll go through it together after. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening, section three. You will hear a forum discussion between the moderators, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Well, countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3,000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier. In my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximise profit for big international businesses. I know Dr Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. 
Dr Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse. But these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. OK, OK, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country as a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with this. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and check your answers in that half minute. Uh, it's a really good idea. You can often catch some mistakes and um, make sure that you have some questions correct that you might have been a little bit uh, uncertain about. Okay, let's go through these together. So I tried to make um, the screen as big as possible. Here, let me make it a little bit smaller so we fit better. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Uh, so um, write no more than one word for each answer here. How long ago was the first record of free trade between nations? Um, and uh, this was uh, quite clear. Uh, one of the speakers says this number very, very clearly. So uh, number 21, um, how long ago was the first rec record of trade uh, between, between nations? Where we know that, hey, this country and that country traded with each other. Prashita and Kishirsha and Nadia agree that it was about 3,000 years ago. Yeah, that's correct. So the answer for 21 is 3,000. So simply you put 3,000 into uh, the space and you're off to the races. That's it. That's all you have to do is just put 3,000 years. Uh, careful one word, okay? Uh, when I did the uh, official exam uh, a week ago, I caught one of my mistakes by checking uh, this and realizing that I wrote an extra word. So I took out the extra word and I'm pretty sure that was a good idea because the end result was quite good. All right, so 3,000, uh, or yeah, 3,000 years ago. All right. Okay, so then we had a flow chart. Now for flow charts, when you have this flow of information, okay, uh, you want to make sure that you can track the audio. Okay, so an important idea, because I said this class is about these band nine ideas. So an important idea to keep in mind is when you have a flow chart, you want to uh, identify some key terms like country A and 20% and country B, so that when you hear these terms in the audio, you know that the answers will be coming soon for the spaces. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, a company in country A imports the product. If the country does not have a free trade agreement, the company must pay uh, something to import the product. Now, uh, ideally, you want to put the exact word that you hear in the audio into the space. So tax or tariff uh, must pay a tariff. Okay. It's very likely that they will also t 
take the word tax, if you put the word tax in there, uh, it is important to try to catch the exact word tariff. Okay. Uh, this is to level the playing field for something. Now here you have two words and or a number. So when you see that it's two words, it's a very good chance that at least uh, one or two answers will be two words. Okay. So uh, level the playing field means to make it fair. So to make it equal, to make it fair. Uh, did anybody catch that? Prashita says it's domestic manufacturers. Yeah, so local producers, right? Domestic manufacturers. Manufacturers. Manufacturers, okay? So domestic manufacturers, good. All right, uh, so spelling does matter in the exam, absolutely. So you want to have the correct spelling for these words. Okay. So far, so good. Now we're moving along. Pay attention to these uh, intermittent parts of the flow chart as well. Again, so you can track your location in the audio. So if the countries do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay uh, um, uh, to pay to import the item. Some advocates of protectionism believe that trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large companies. Odota says they're worried about maximizing profit. Yeah, and if you miss this type of a question, you can almost guess it uh, as long as you're following with the information, okay? So protectionism means to not have free trade. So countries have to pay taxes for exporting, importing. Um, and uh, free trade, of course, means that there's no tax. So in the EU, you have free trade. In certain uh, Asian countries, you have free trade. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, US, Mexico is a good example of free trade. Okay, so a couple more for the first half. So again, write no more than three words and or a number for each answer. Uh, some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the something and not be sidetracked by the needs of the. Okay, here you have to have the correct order of words. So. Uh, in your answer sheet on the computer, of course, that's logical, but in your answer booklet in the paper-based uh, version of the test, blank one has to go here, comma, and then blank two, okay? So, but we must emphasize the needs of the many and not be sidetracked by the needs of the few. Now, you have to be careful here. Um, so, me here. Uh, very good job, um, Kashirsha, very good, uh, Nadia, very nice, uh, Shakzad, very good. Okay, uh, the tricky part here was in that the audio, they actually say few first and then many. So I think the speaker says something like we, we must not be um, limited by the needs of the few, we must concentrate on the needs of the many. So they kind of reverse it. So you see this paraphrasing. And in fact, I had this in the reading section last week, uh, where in the reading paragraph, it was a very similar type of question. And in the paragraph, it was uh, like, uh, quote unquote, few came first and then many after. But in the um, question or answer part of the uh, uh, exam, uh, it was the reverse. Okay, so be really careful when you have uh, two answers for one question in the listening or reading. Sometimes the trick that IELTS is doing with the paraphrasing to see if you're paying attention is they're uh, reversing the order of the words. Okay, everybody got that? All right. Okay. So uh, you have to be careful, be really careful, pay attention from start to finish. Okay, 26, uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases something. Now again, 
you could find, so you could probably get the answer. Um, yeah, some parts, Nadi, of the exam were challenging, I thought. Um, some parts of the reading and listening, for sure. Uh, again, uh, IELTS, remember everyone, is an English proficiency exam. It's not just, it's not an ESL test. It's not an English as a second language test. Native speakers, like teachers, take the exam as well. Okay, um, so uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases competition, that's right. Okay, so it increases competition, yeah, uh, and that makes sense. Okay, so again, if you didn't get that, you can probably guess that, okay? All right, let's keep going. So now we had to complete the chart. Um, an important idea to remember here, again, we're focusing on band nine ideas, okay, um, is uh, the heading of each of the columns. So cause, okay, and effect. Uh, so obviously here the speakers are going to be uh, speaking about some causes and some effects, so some results, okay, all right. So here's the cause. The cause is entering into a free trade agreement What's the effect? The effect is jeopardizing human rights standards. Okay. Uh, the cause, sweatshops collapsing. What's the effect? The conditions are highlighted in the something. Um, what is that for 27? Okay, so where are the conditions uh, highlighted? Where do we see these? Balbir Singh says in the media. Very good. Okay, and again... It's no more than one word. Now, uh, for most of the questions, they will be one word answers. I noticed that as well, okay? Uh, just like in these exams also. So it's in the media. Very good. Obviously clear, nice spelling there, okay? Okay, very good. Uh, good job, uh, Ozoda, uh, Manish, Rashika, very nice, okay? Okay, um, so, the realization that such incidents are not isolated, so they're not unique, that's the cause, uh, implore companies and something to raise the bar. So who has to raise the bar? Raise the bar means to increase the standards. Okay, Mihir says governments, Prashita says government. Uh, Prashita, you would get it wrong because you don't have an S. Alpha, same thing. Manish, same thing, okay? Uh, the only one to get it correct so far was me here um, and everybody else. I see Balbir now and Kashir show with an S on the end. You have to have the word governments. Okay. Governments is countable. All right. And um, companies, you have an S here. So definitely have a plural. Okay. If your first noun is a plural, check to make sure that your second noun is also a plural. All right. If it's not a plural, you lose that mark. Okay. So plural, plural. All right. Keep that idea in mind. Okay. All right. Now here, um, you had multiple choice and you see that there's a lot of information here. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible to read all of these choices. And I kind of um, realize this as well again uh, while I was doing my exam that with these kinds of questions even if you're really fast if you're a native speaker um, I had just barely enough time to take a glance at all of the information so it's much more important to focus on the question so what is Dr. Young's main point advocating for free trade and the answer is emphasized so the speakers really intonate it like they put heavy emphasis on the answer you can almost hear it like oh here comes an answer um so what does he say he says something like uh it's not perfect but it works okay so or it's the best we have something like that okay he really emphasized that did anybody catch that so instead of looking at the choices, did anybody catch Dr. Young, um, who was the, the little bit younger sounding professor with the softer voice say, oh, it's not perfect, but it's kind of like the best that we have right now. Did anybody catch him say that or emphasize that in his tone? Okay, because that's what you should have been listening for. 
about his opinion about free trade, right? Is him going, well, it's, it's not the greatest or it's not ideal, it's not perfect, but it works, okay? And then if you caught that, then you can look for it. So free trade agreements are the biggest economic driver. No, oh, free trades are, are not perfect, but they're a good step towards increasing global welfare. So that's B, okay? So you're focusing. So again, I get this question a lot from students is like, how do I do multiple choice in the listening? How do I do multiple choice in the reading? Uh, tip number one, idea number one, is really focus on the question, okay? Not the choices. Because you just simply don't really have enough time to identify the right choice in real time in the listening, okay? All right. So it's the same idea. Um, so uh, what is Dr. Sturgeon's main point in advocating for protectionism? So why does he choose this one? And I remember him saying something like, well, it's because free trade, which is the other option, uh, makes the rich wealthy and the poor poor, something like that. Um, so overall wealth is increased in society. I don't think he says that middle class jobs are the foundation of an economy. Um, okay, free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth, wealth in the hands of an elite few. So that's the closest match is C. So number 30 was C, okay? All right, uh, count up your answers. How many did you get correct from 10? Now, ideally in um, part three and part four, uh, you're looking to get, well, I would say um, seven or more. Okay, so that would be uh, the, the kind of goal um, for both part three and part four. You want to get seven or more. If you're getting less than seven, you're kind of sliding down the, the band score shoot, if you will. Um, so six is still kind of like, okay, um, but seven or more, that's where you want to be. Okay. All right. And I can see that, uh, Azoda got six, Rashika got six, Uma got nine, Nadia got seven. All right. So we've got a good range. So you're aiming for seven or more. Okay. All right, everyone, let's do this one more time. So let's do part four and let's do it until the end. Part four is a little bit unique. <clears throat> you just listen. There's no breaks. Okay. So start to finish. It's smooth, it's seamless. In part four, you get challenged much more to hold the information in your head and you really have to be ahead of the audio, okay? So in part four, the idea, and this does take a lot of practice, and I realized again when I was doing my test that this is what I really had to do to uh, get the questions um, and answer correctly, is basically stay ahead of the audio. So I have all of the information at the beginning in my head and I'm also looking already at the next uh, question or the next piece of information before the audio even gets there. So uh, part four of the listening is testing um, your ability to listen, hold information in your head, also go forward with the information um, uh, in the audio as well and, and anticipate what's coming. Okay, so it's a real combination. So it's testing your listening and it's also testing your reading and comprehension skill as well. Okay, all right, um, so let's do this. I'm just gonna hop back. Again, everyone, please uh, save your answers until the end of the audio and then we'll go through it together. Don't put answers into the chat because it can be confusing for others, especially if you put wrong answers into the chat. It's just terrible. So just save it until the end and then we'll go through it, okay? All right, everyone, so <clears throat> here we go. Let's go back to the audio on, the, on our websites. And then uh, if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume, use a headset. Um, and here we are. And turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture on the lesser known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist, Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art and well respected for his architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the years spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul, harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and check your answers, especially in part four. Um, you can really pick up some marks here if you missed some questions. Uh, this was actually very, very similar to the part four that I had. It was on a different topic, but identical fill in the blanks um, for all the 10 questions, actually, uh, not even the first two. So all 10 questions were fill in the blanks. Um, and this is what it, what it was, yeah. So, all right, <clears throat> let's do this together. Um, so the beginning, a uh, little bit gentle here. Uh, so A, on the exam, B, not on the exam. Uh, material from the third class of the week. Uh, will it be on the exam or not? 
uh, Fogo PubGM <laughs> says uh, it's B and A. Um, and uh, let's see, Shakzad says it's A and B. Um, it's uh, so um, the professor clearly says that uh, materials from this class uh, will be on the exam, but materials from uh, the last two classes in the week will not be on the exam. So uh, the correct answers here uh, would be B and A. So it was B and A, okay? Uh, third, second and third class of the week, not on the exam. This class, probably the start of the week, it's on the exam, okay? So hopefully you got that. That was fairly uh, straightforward, all right? Okay, let's keep going. So here it was no more than two words, and um, that was exactly how I uh, had it as well. I think it was just one word for me. Um, so they don't expect you to do more than two words usually uh, for these fill in the blanks, just because it's already challenging enough to go through it. You really have to follow along and paraphrase simultaneously while you're listening. So they are definitely paraphrasing a lot uh, between the audio and the questions. So while Michelangelo is perhaps the most, uh, is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine, Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta and uh, the statue named something thought to symbolize male beauty. It is a name, Deepa, you have to have a capital D, um, so careful with names, okay? It's David, absolutely, okay? So David with a capital D, thought to symbolize male beauty, okay. Architectural achievements. So when I was reviewing part four, the idea was just to review these main headings especially. I didn't have really enough time to clearly read all the questions, but definitely I paid attention to these main headings so that I knew where I was in the audio, and that's very, very useful, okay? So far more than just a painter, Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on uh, St. Peter's Basilica for something until his death in 1564. So um, two words are needed here, okay? Or a number and a word is needed here. Yeah, very good, Prashita. 17 years. Uh, Tushar, just 17 is not enough. So it's 17 years, okay? If you don't have the word years, mm, you're in trouble. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting uh, structure because future something and something. So uh, this is one space uh, for these two answers. So future what and what um, faithfully carried out his designs. Okay, and you can check the spellings for this. Uh, very good, Prashita. Popes and architects. Okay, so future popes. And you'll notice later that Popes is actually spelt with a capital P usually. Um, so Popes and architects. Some uh, figures from um, uh, Christianity, uh, they take special letters like the capital P or God is spelt with a capital G. Um, and uh, you can see that even if you don't know that you can be like, oh, I don't I didn't know that How am I supposed to know that uh, you'll see it later in the text? Okay, so popes and architects so pay attention to that I think if you put a small P here IELTS will give it to you. They're not that hardcore. Okay faithfully carried out his designs Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city now. It's a city here. It's definitely a capital here um, so it's uh, seen around the rest of the city of what? And they clearly say this, okay? Um, Vatican, city of Vatican is okay, but we actually say Vatican City, so it's not just Vatican. Uh, definitely it helps a little bit to know this information. Uh, city of Rome, 
Okay, the speaker does clearly say that you can see Michelangelo's works around the city of Rome in different places, including the Vatican and Capoli Capolini Hill site. I know it's a little bit confusing because Vatican City is actually in the city of Rome. So Vatican City is a state within uh, Rome itself. Okay. So it's kind of a unique situation for anybody that knows Roman history and the history of Italy will know that unique feature. Okay, um, so servant of the papacy. Okay, and here you can see Pope with a capital P, as I mentioned. So he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. He once built a something of the Pope, only to see it melted down for cannon parts just a few years later, and he spent two years of his life on it. Uh, what was it? Sabrina, you are very welcome. Happy to help. Uh, bronze statue. That's right. Now, if you just have statue, that's okay. If you have bronze statue, that is perfect. Yeah. So he built a bronze statue of the Pope. Very good. Okay. Moreover, the something he had to work in we're often substandard. Now, you can almost guess this word if you didn't catch it. And fortunately, that is the way part four is. You can kind of almost guess some of the words if you're uh, careful. Okay. All right. Uh, Prashita says conditions. Very good, Prashita. You're not only accurate, but you're also quick. Uh, Saga says conditions. Tushar agrees. Balbir, all in capital letters, completely okay. All right, uh, conditions, yeah, uh, plural, very important. Uh, the conditions he had to work in were often substandard, often being forced to live and work in small cramped spaces with a number of other men. Okay. All right, um, so let's keep going here. Literary works. It is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own something. Again, if you caught this, that's great. You can almost guess this one as well. Um, so what was the professor kind of disappointed about that uh, Michelangelo never really got to explore his own? Yeah, that's right. Very good, everyone. Creativity, creativity. Uh, common noun, so... All lowercase, okay, so creativity, okay. While his life may have been difficult, some people argue that this difficulty made him a better artist. Uh, something was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life. Now, this is a common noun, but it's the start of the sentence, so you can capitalize the first letter. And this was kind of interesting. If you caught it, you were, it was very clear. It was like, oh, okay, he did that too, okay. Yeah, it was poetry, poetry. He wrote poems. Who knew, right? Michelangelo wrote poems. Okay. Poetry was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life. Though his writings never made much of an artistic impact, they do offer a window into his tortured genius. So poetry, very nice. Okay, good job. I see uh, Uma, Kashirsha, uh, Asakson, and many others got that correct. That's nice. Okay, so yeah, poetry. Anybody ever read a poem from Michelangelo? I haven't, <laughs> so I'm not sure if anybody else has. I've seen, I've seen his statues. I saw uh, some of his statues in the Louvre Museum in France and some of his statues in other places as well um, around uh, Europe and even in uh, a couple museums in North America, but uh, never his poems, never his poems. I, they're very mystery to me. Okay, everyone, so great job. The question now, of course, is uh, what did you get out of 40? Uh, so how did you do? Let's add it up. Uh, we have a score calculator on our website. I'll show you where that is. So for the listening uh, and the reading, um, we have a score calculator uh, so that you can convert your band scores. Let me darken the screen a little bit so you can... Uh, see this. Okay, so at the bottom of the website here at uh, ahelp.com or glshelp.com, you have a score calculator. It's just a little extra feature that you can click on. And then once you're in there, 
there's an explanation. And then, of course, it tells you uh, listening out of 40. Uh, what was your raw score? Mihir says that Mihir got 36. So you put in 36, and it will tell you that 36 is a band 8. Okay, so, yeah, you really got to get high up there to get some uh, high band scores. Okay, so 36, 37 is an 8.5. All right. Um, Prashita, 35, I believe, is still a band 8. Uh, 35, yeah, band 8, very good. Okay, uh, Sabrina, 39, that's where your band 9 starts. So 39 is a 9, 39 and 40. Okay, very nice. All right, um, so you have that score calculator. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, and um, definitely go to our websites. This is the General IELTS website here. Uh, it's a one-time payment for lifetime access when you click that big red button so you can use it every day until you pass your IELTS exam. And there is a ton of useful information there for you. Uh, we are world leaders when it comes to IELTS exam preparation. So uh, if you're having troubles with writing, Aman, uh, get a hold of us and let us know. Uh, that's it for today. I will be back tomorrow. We've got a couple more classes tomorrow. Uh, question and answer session for members and then speaking part three, practice for everyone. Again, students, aehelp.com for academic IELTS, gielthelp.com for general. Have a fantastic uh, rest of your day. Uh, Eugen, always putting a smile on our faces with those emojis at the end of class. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, keep studying, keep working hard, look towards the future, learn from the past. Uh, much love to all of you. I'm Adrian signing out from Budapest for now. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.